And I think here, before we get too much further down the road of the, of the war narrative, we need to uh, revisit or, or, or bring up the reason for the season here, the reason we're having this session here in Fredericksburg, Texas, instead of in Washington, instead of in Washington, D.C., or you know, somewhere in Virginia. Uh, and that's Admiral Chester Nimitz. Uh, one of his great talents, well, let's, let's start with his, his, his uh, ascension to become uh, SINCPAC, Commander in Chief Pacific. Um, Admiral Kimball is relieved following the Pearl Harbor attack. And Nimitz's job is to go out as his relief. Uh, he shows up at Pearl Harbor, uh, 10 days after the Pearl Harbor attack, and, uh, and, and he realizes the, the extent of the destruction, which I re I'm not sure it had been fully reported, at least in his correspondence with his wife, Catherine. Um, there's an exchange, which I, when I was working on Neptune's Inferno, my Guadalcanal book, I recount this uh, exchange from December 19th. Chester Nimitz, uh, or uh, Catherine Nimitz writes to him, you always wanted to command the Pacific Fleet. You always thought that would be the height of glory, she writes to him. And he responds, darling, the fleet's at the bottom of the sea. Nobody must know that here, but I've got to tell you. And later he says, I'll be lucky to last six months. This was in his private correspondence, and part of his genius was never to allow this pessimism to leak out in public. He was serene, he was clear-headed, he was very good with people, um, never more so than when he, he shows up at Pearl Harbor uh, as Kimball's replacement and decides to retain in place, I think, all of Kimball's staff. And all, every one of them. Every one of them expected to be fired because the captain goes down to the ship and the staff follows. But Nimitz kept them all in place. He realized that good people could be caught in bad circumstances and that people could improve their performance. And, and something else Admiral Nimitz once said really stayed with me. Uh, in staff meetings, he would say things like, you know, I realize things don't look good for us. Uh, I realize we're suffering, but I promise you, the enemy is suffering too. Because war was not easy, no matter who was on the offensive or who was on the defensive. He appreciated that whatever was taking place, the Japanese had long lines of supply, their garrisons were suffering attrition, and, um, and the going was hard for them too. So keep the faith, stay on plan, and we're gonna turn this thing around because uh, I think Admiral Nimitz had to have appreciated even to a level well beyond Admiral Yamamoto uh, what, what, how, how great the sleeping giant that he had at his disposal. And so these, these initial offensives uh, in Guadalcanal are ultimately successful. Uh, they're driven by uh, this clear-headed sense of mission, um, his superb um, ability with people. At the height of the Guadalcanal campaign, or I should say at its depth, um, after Savile Island, uh, well on into October, when, when our commander down there is faltering, it's a good friend of Admiral Nimitz's, um, Vice Admiral Robert Gormley, his comm SOPAC. Um, Gormley was in the midst of uh, what Nimitz and his staff discerned to be a, a nervous breakdown in, in theater command in the most important campaign of the war thus far. And so he sends down Admiral Halsey for a little look-see, uh, at least that's what he tells Halsey, he says he's gonna send him to South Pacific, go down to New Maya, look around and report. Um, Halsey gets down there and realizes he's handed orders that make him the relief of Admiral Gormley. Nimitz's way with Gormley is instructive. Uh, Nimitz is, is, is very good with people. He was the uh, commander of the Navy's Bureau of Navigation, which is, for some reason, the, the Navy name for the personnel office. <laughs> he's very good with people, and, he, and he, he tells his old, or he asks his old friend, he says, he says, Bob, he says, you realize the stakes are such that we need to have the very best man we can find uh, to lead this theater. Do you think you're that man? And, and he had to elicit the response from Gormley, uh, no, I don't think I am. He was able to elicit that level of candor from his old friend uh, to Gormley's own detriment. Fire me, I'm over my head. So the, you know, the, fact that, uh, the, the fact that Gormley was in, was in the throes of a, a sort of nervous breakdown was established later in some correspondence that I was given by Gormley's own son um, when I was working on Neptune's Inferno. But it's a great moment of leadership because it shows what Nimitz can do with his people. Uh, that, that experience in the personnel office put him in, he, 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 he sort of knew everybody's portfolio. And he had a great interpersonal skill, uh, a very level head, uh, and a fighter through and through. Always on the, you know, leaning forward, conducting plans to take the offensive, to take and retain the initiative against the Japanese all across the Pacific. Um, jumping back a bit, just in the, in the days after Pearl Harbor, he unleashed Halsey and, and, and Frank Jack Fletcher on the Marshall and Gilbert's Islands, which laid the, laid the groundwork which, uh, for the midway victory, right? You, you get your pilots some experience, they're gonna hit some lightly defended islands, and then when 
Japanese fleet comes calling, you know, they've got their act together. Um, so, you know, he was able to kind of oversee this, uh, you know, the improvement in capability, the, the, the assignment of the right types of leaders to the right types of billets uh, to ensure that the war effort um, would turn around. And, and that he did with a vengeance. It's a, it's a profound thing in, in, to be in this building to talk about the man since, you know, in my mind, I frequently see him running around this building as a six-year-old child, and uh, I think sometimes at night I actually do. And uh, he, uh, uh, we have several photographs of him uh, shot in 1890 or 91, uh, one famously in front of the building uh, under the sign. Uh, my favorite is him in the saloon with his cousin, and uh, which is right up at the front of this building. and. Uh, Sadly, it's not a saloon anymore. We need to fix that. The, um, the, the fact is, though, that, uh, you know, he, he, a lot of people aren't familiar with his, his life story and the fact that his father was cautioned not to marry because he had a weak heart, but he fell in love and, and, and uh, married his sweetheart. And uh, uh, shortly after Nimitz, life began in the womb, he died. And so Nimitz was, uh, uh, he and his mother uh, were alone uh, upon his birth. And uh, they moved into his father's father's hotel here. And so he spent the first six years of his life with his grandpa, his paternal grandfather, being the guiding influence, a male influence in his life. And, uh, if he had an affinity for the sea before he joined the Navy, uh, it was because of his grandfather who had been, as a young man, in the German merchant marine uh, in Germany before he immigrated to the United States as one of the first settlers here. And, and uh, so that, that the seagoing stories of his grandfather certainly were an influence, but the fact he ended up in the Navy at all was pure happenstance because by the time uh, he, uh, even found out about the possibility of going into the military as a career. Um, it happened in the hotel where his, his uh, uncle, who is now his stepfather, uh, had the hotel in, in Kerrville, and famously a couple of uh, uh, plebs from the West Point came through in their uniforms, and he was at the desk and was intrigued by them, and they told him what a great deal it was because they got a free college education, and he realized this was a step, uh, step forward, so he desperately wanted to get into West Point and follow, follow that path, and uh, was told quickly by congressmen in this area there was no, no appointments available to West Point for everybody get him into the Naval Academy right now, and it's by that simple slip of faith that Nimitz ended up in the Navy, uh, that that appointment was available, and he went into the Navy. And, and uh, but the, the, no doubt his, Growing up in, in, in this, what we call the hill country today, that he called the plains of Texas in his writings, uh, th this, this formed his, his life and his outlook on life, and certainly the strong sense of culture and identity of being a Texan and pride in this nation were, were, were driving influences in, in what became the man. Yeah, absolutely. And I, lo I love that story from his time as a destroyer captain. Um, uh, was it the, the Decatur? Yes. He had command of USS Decatur, uh, runs her aground during an exercise, um, and he comes through this, you know, with a fighting spirit and a sense of, I mean, a, you know, a real sense of self-possession, because he's just run his, his tin can aground, which is bound to get anybody relieved from command, right? Court martial. There's really no way out of it. And so he goes to his, his superior officer, and he says, sir, he says, uh, in, 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 in the tin can navy, You've asked for us to be hard charging and aggressive, and that's exactly what I've been. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I must have been the twinkle in his eye or some unrecorded virtue or maybe another uh, line that wasn't in the biography. Uh, it saves his career. And, um, and, and, and then you know, Nimitz is on into submarines and he's in a, you know, into other, uh, before you know it, he's supervising, you know, overseeing the expansion of what I call the fleet at flood tide. I mean, the expansion not only of sea control assets such as aircraft carriers and battleships, but uh, amphibians to carry marine divisions over thousands of miles of ocean uh, on route to the Asian mainland itself if necessary to, to bring Japan to heel. 
So how does that happen? You know, I go over here, you talked about the pictures you have in the museum. It's that life-size picture of him standing with his grandfather over there. Is he 16? Is he 18? No, how old is he he's in that 20. Picture? He's he 20? He just graduated the Naval Academy. He's a youngster, but, you know, I mean, you look at him and you can see the conviction in his eyes and you can, you know, maybe, maybe we superimpose all this in retrospect, but I, I see greatness. <laughs> I see greatness coming in that young man. I have a pretty good feeling about it. Well, no question. <laughs> uh, the, other, the other aspect of his life in the Navy, though, is that it's worth pointing out in, in the context of today is uh, he, he received an assignment in the early 20s to, uh, to because of his uh, submarine service already, to go to Pearl Harbor and design and oversee the construction of the submarine base at Pearl Harbor. And uh, it and the oil tanks were two targets the Japanese missed at Pearl Harbor. Uh, and, and those were probably the two greatest mistakes in that entire battle not doing a third strike to take out the oil tanks particularly, but also the submarine base, because the submarines were critical in the advance of, of us uh, uh, once they finally got torpedoes that worked to, to uh, actually uh, win the war against Japan. That's right. So really, the, you know, the future is here. Um, Pearl Harbor foretells what happens in the next generation and a half or two in terms of the Navy's development. Um, Nimitz gets out there, uh, his old command, the USS Arizona, is a uh, permanent wreck. His change of command is uh, undertaken on board a submarine, and it's those submarines which go out and raise so much ruckus for the Japanese, and, and Nimitz kind of, um, you know, makes that hard decision early in the war. I, you know, we've only got enough fuel to send out either the carriers, the battleships, let's send the carriers down to Guadalcanal, and the rest is destiny. Uh, by 1944, early 44, we've got four task groups worth of fast carriers, 15 in total, uh, they're no longer hitting and running, they're hitting and staying. Um, and we have an amphibious navy that can carry uh, the likes of Holland Smith's Marines uh, to, to Saipan and, and, and points westward. And it's a spectacular story. Well, it, it, and it, it, it all starts right here. <laughs>